it's hard to believe that four weeks have passed. Uh, we have got some announcements here today. Uh, if you want the easiest dose of Nashville history, you really need to go to the Nashville City Cemetery's Living History Tour, which this year is going to be uh, on Saturday, October 12th, two weeks from now, from 2 to 4 and from 6 to 8. And it is really more fun. You can take your family members because it's quick. Each year they pick a theme, and this year the theme is uh, triumph and tragedy. And so you're going to see the heroes, the people who did well, and some tragedies out there in between. Generally what they do is pick eight to ten people that are buried there every year, and they have uh, uh, actors in costumes uh, at each of these spots, and you'll have a guide that will lead you in a group through, and they do this about every five minutes, and they've got places for you to sit around these places, but the talks are no more than five minutes, so you keep moving, and if the weather is nice, and even if it's hot, as soon as the, uh, the after the evening shift from six to eight, as soon as the sun gets over Fort Negley, it is very pleasant because the trees out there are so really, really pretty and provide a lot of shade. So this cemetery has been Gloria Bond's cause, Nan Teeter's cause, my cause, Caroline's cause for a long, long time. And it's really interesting to see the change in it from the first time I went out there with Gloria a long time ago to uh, the way it looks today. They've got excellent signage. They've done a lot of planting out there. And it, it will last, you'll be out there no more than an hour, and all of the money goes to the City Cemetery Association, uh, which they do a lot of work. They've got an excellent website. If any of you think you've got family buried out at the City Cemetery, I encourage you to uh, go uh, uh, look on their website, and they've got a, a, a uh, an alphabetical listing of the people who are buried out there, and you can learn quite a lot. In some cases, they have put up uh, 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 some uh, obituaries, some photographs of the people. And you know, the thing about that cemetery, it is Nashville's history from the coming of James and Charlotte Robertson up through the Civil War. There are two of the original Jubilee singers buried out there, Mabel Imes and Ella Shepard. It's one of the very few cemeteries in the South that was actually integrated. Uh, not only was it integrated according to race, but it was also integrated in that Jews were buried there, a few Jews were buried there before the Temple Cemetery was created before the Civil War, and Catholics were buried in that cemetery as well. Uh, so it is really quite an interesting place, and I always say if you want uh, to learn Nashville history the easy way, go on the City Cemetery Tour and go on a tour out at Mount Olivet. Now Mount Olivet is the cemetery that really gives gives this Gilded Age history that we're talking about right now and up to the present. There is a living history tour out there every October, but it is a, a Civil War tour exclusively. So sometime I will give a tour out there, and if we've got your email address over there, which I think, Caroline, don't we have everybody's email address? If, uh, uh, we will send you an email that I'm going to do a tour at it at Mount Olivet. It is really one of the most beautiful Victorian cemeteries in the United States. It's, uh, it's really quite a lovely place to see. So I want to go back to our questions, but Mike Hassel, I don't see him anywhere yet, so I'm going to save the answer to his question about the trial and the uh, conviction and the uh, uh, other parts of the trial, and I have done a little research on this because I did not answer his question very thoroughly last week, so I'll come back to this if Mike comes in. But as you see here, I have put some dates on here, and can you imagine a two 
month long jury trial in Nashville in 1909. And they had actually arrested the, sh the former sheriff for uh, uh, assisting the Coopers. The WCTU, all of the prohibition people ab said it is absolutely, it was a conspiracy that they had planned it all along and the Coopers vehemently denied that. They said they were going to the governor's mansion and they ran into him on the street. So the one witness to the thing, Mrs. Eastman, who was uh, lived very near there, she was so totally befuddled that her story was not particularly helpful. But the, the Coopers appealed their convictions to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld Duncan Cooper's conviction, and Robbins was reversed uh, on grounds of a, a technicality in the first trial. And then within an hour, Governor Patterson issued a pardon to Duncan Cooper. So for the WCTU, this was just the ammunition they needed to convince Tennessee that they need, the state needed to go dry. And here are those clippings uh, that I had. I've done a little clearer copies this week for you so that I think you can see them a little bit better. But all of this happened in 1910. So from the time Senator Carmack was shot, in 1908 until 1910, April 1910, for two, two, almost two years, a year and a half, this was the no news story in Nashville. But we have lots of other news stories going on here, and I did want to make one more point about this chart that I showed you the other day, because uh, this is why I think Tennessee history is quite different from the history of the other 10 states of the former Confederacy. After the ex-Confederates came back into power, the states, all of the uh, 10 other states that seceded for the un from the Union were staunchly Southern Democrats, and they voted as a block, and even people like Franklin Roosevelt knew the power that they had uh, because they voted as a block. Unlike those other 10 states, the Tem Tennessee Democratic Party from time to time got into a big argument within the ranks of the party, and the, as a result of the big fight in the party, a Republican or a third party candidate got elected governor. So the other southern states did not have a Republican governor or, uh, until the civil rights movement of the 1960s when those conservative southern Democrats uh, became uh, Republicans. And, and Tennessee had Republican governors from time to time. We, uh, the Democrats split over the convict lease system. They split over prohibition, as you see here. They're going to split over women having the right to vote. There are several issues that split the Tennessee Democrats from time to time. And uh, each, each time, uh, they lost power, and so that, that was a wake-up call to the Tennessee Democrats. You better get your act together, or the Republicans are going to take over the House and the Senate. So that did not happen. Another thing I want to mention about this period of time, because this is in the news uh, today as well. I picked up my New York Times this morning, and uh, there was a big article about memorials once again, and this is a very controversial subject of, of the, the memorials to the ex-Confederates, the leaders of the Confederacy. And a big point that I think needs to be made about all of these monuments is the time in which they were put up. And they were not put up in the 1860s and early 1870s. They were put up both before and after uh, around 1900. The uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy was founded here in Nashville in the 1890s. And these women across the South had been working to figure out ways to re memorialize uh, these Confederate veterans who were dying and the men that had actually been killed in the war. And so this was what brought these women to Nashville and they, they started this national organization. And they raised money for statues and monuments all over the South. The county I grew up in Texas, 
I, I don't think it was even a county. I don't think there was anybody living up there during the Civil War, but even it had a Confederate memorial on the courthouse square. And so the Sam Davis Monument, which is down on the uh, southwest corner of the Capitol grounds, uh, was dedicated in 1909, the, the boy martyr of the Confederacy. He was con picked up in Nashville with uh, documents in his boots, and he was tried and convicted and hanged. And Southerners were somewhat outraged about this, but he was caught with uh, documents in, in that, that uh, were quite accusatory in his boots. Another thing that happened along during here was that the Sons of the Confederacy decided that they would do, do a monument to the women of the Confederacy. And so here you have fame, the goddess there in the center of this statue with a Confederate woman who is on your left, and then you see her son or her husband or her brother there uh, where she is offering him comfort. This is one of the most beautiful statues in town, and I bet none of you have hardly ever seen it. It is hidden behind a big branch of a tree. It is, it is at the south end of the War Memorial Auditorium in a little courtyard. It backs up to the, the wall that is between uh, the, the legislative plaza and the street there, and there's big branches in front of it, so it's pretty impossible to get, well, you can get back there, it's no problem to get back there, but it's pretty impossible to see it from a distance because you have to look around that tree and get all the way back there. But Belle Kenny designed this, she is the woman who designed the statue of Mars in the War Memorial Auditorium, and it, it is quite a beautiful statue. Now, there was a question last week about the panic, uh, the, the Spanish flu epidemic, and we, we discussed the fact that it really had nothing to do with Spain. It was just a very contagious kind of flu, and somebody asked, well, how many people in Nashville died during this epidemic? And I found uh, in a newspaper article that over 1,300 people died, but most of those who died were in Old Hickory, and it was because those young people were living in dorm-like conditions, and so they were living in close proximity, eating together, sleeping in the same room, and so the, most of the deaths were in Old Hickory. But the, the mayor of Nashville called an emergency uh, at one point when the, it was at its height and all the movie theaters closed. There were a couple of Sundays that the churches didn't have church. There were no worship activities going on in houses of worship across um, Nashville, and the schools were closed. So it was quite frightening uh, to see people in the prime of life. But again, the, the, most of the mortalities were out there in Old Hickory where these young people people were living together and living, uh, you know, sharing everything that they did. Now, for the remainder of the day, we've got really two really big stories to talk about. And these are some that I never get tired of talking about because, frankly, they're just so interesting. Uh, and one that I'm going to be talking quite a lot about for the next year is the story of how women got the right to vote. Uh, some of you who have heard me speak before have heard me say that when I came here to graduate school, I didn't hear any part of this story. It was not in any of the history books. Uh, it was out there, but part of the reason that it wasn't in the books was because men wrote the books, <laughs> and, and the books were, um, the books were, uh, uh, male activities, wars and elections. And I went to the mayor's election, uh, to the mayor's inauguration on Saturday out at Stratford STEM High School. It was really one of the most uplifting things I've been to in a long time. When the council came in after the mayor and vice mayor, and 
all of the council were wearing yellow roses, the symbol of suffrage. I thought I was going to lose it right there <laughs> and start sobbing because it, it's such a milestone. Half of our Metropolitan Nashville Council is now women. Every group in Nashville is, 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 is within uh, the council membership. We've got a Muslim councilwoman uh, as a councilman at large. If you have not heard Zulfa, at Suara speak. You need to hear her. She is a CPA. She and her husband came here from Nigeria. He's a doctor. She is very impressive and she knows Nashville very, very well. You've got um, the LGBTQ communi uh, community, well represented, Hispanic councilman. Uh, you've got a lot of diversity there. And let me tell you, this whole affair, which was an hour and 15, 20 minutes long, uh, it was diversity and it made you proud of our city because there was a mariachi band and the whole crowd was clapping to that and I kept thinking, you know, the people playing their violins are going to get, they're not going to be able to keep up with the crowd <laughs> that was clapping so much. And the Tennessee State University choir sang, uh, there was a rabbi, there, were, there was a priest, there were Protestant ministers and judges, uh, uh, female judges, uh, giving the oaths of, of office to the mayor, vice mayor, and council. It was quite a rousing thing, and it was really, 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 uh, I think, a joyful occasion. So now the hard work has begun, and the theme, of course, was unity, and so I think the important thing is we've all got to work together here in Nashville uh, to... Uh, enjoy the place that we uh, uh, have enjoyed all of these years. And I always read the letters to the editor of the Tennessean. Uh, you know, I read the obituaries and the letters to the editor. And I always read the letters to the editor to see if any of y'all have written the letters. So, uh, uh, but there was one today that, you know, wants to go back to the good old days. And frankly, I don't think any of us really want to go back to the good old days. There might be one person in this room that doesn't own a cell phone of some kind, but I doubt it. And, you know, I certainly don't want to give up my phone, and I'm not a high-end user. You don't see me with my phone in my pocket or anything here. But I, uh, I, I, we don't want to go back to that. We don't want to give up our interstate highways. You know, we don't want to give up a lot of things that we have benefited so well from. So I think we've all got to work, work together here and work with our council people and the council at large, the mayor and the vice mayor. So if any of you don't know who your council person is, we can help you figure that out and you need to let them know that you are around and one of their constituents. Now, back to the subject of women. Women's work has always been accepted as women's work, but because women did it fairly quietly most of the time, it was never really seen as real work. As long as a family lived on a farm and there were agriculture was the primary uh, thing there, that no one in the family is really earning money, you might have a little uh, left over to sell. But as long as these farms were mom and pop subsistence farms, the women had a certain level of equality. And the women always, always back back as far as you want to go, uh, had a community of women around them, no matter whether they lived in a town like the fledgling little community of Nashville when the Robertsons and Donaldsons came and established this city, or, or where, whether they lived out in a very remote part of the state. And the thing that connected all of these women together was childbirth. Women had, had uh, birthed the babies, and it was, con it was a completely female occasion. Country women would call whoever was designated as the midwife. Uh, there was a, a community working together. Now, 
women worked together in the churches. There were generally more women going to church than men, often here in Nashville, in the early days of our city after Tennessee became a state. Uh, women came together and did sewing projects. And you can imagine, these women are not climbing a ladder of success. They're not saying, well, I want to be the president of this quilting circle, and then I'm going from the quilting circle <laughs> to the XYZ club, and then I'm going to the next club. They worked together as equals. And and you can imagine that women, I, I know men, you're going to find this very surprising, but women talk when they work. And so uh, these women often talked. And as time went by, they talked about problems that needed to be solved in the communities. And so women are, are looking at what's going on and paying attention to everything that's going on from the early, early, earliest days. After the Civil War, the group that finally took traction and became the very largest uh, activist group of women in the country, and I would say that the WCTU was by far the largest women's group up to this time. The Suffrage Association never had but a fraction of the membership of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And part of the thing about the temperance union was that they had a cause that crossed a lot of different lines. Uh, certainly there was the problem of alcoholism and domestic violence associated with uh, excessive drinking. Uh, but they also had a leader who stepped up. And when Frances Willard, the woman you see here in the middle of this photo, uh, stepped up and became the leader, the group grew exponentially. They wore white ribbons. There was the White Ribbon Brigade. And they put activism into women's uh, vocabulary that if there's something you want to fix, don't rely on the men to fix it. You get out there and work to get it fixed. And so the WCTU uh, took off here in Tennessee. Now, as you know, we talked about this last week <laughs> uh, uh, when uh, Senator Carmack uh, had uh, lost that uh, 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 Democratic primary in the summer of 1908 to Governor Patterson. Uh, the Women's Temperance Christian Union were really up in arms because they didn't like him. He was for local option. And local option, which was what Tennessee, I think, had when I came here to graduate school in this, uh, 1971, I think Tennessee had local option then, uh, the counties and the cities would decide for themselves. But these women wanted all the state to be dry. And by 1908, they had been busy passing little pieces of laws. So the laws that they passed were can't be within four miles of a school, a saloon, or a place selling liquor. You can't be drinking here, there, and yon. And so they really went after Governor Patterson after Senator Carmack was killed. And his response to their uh, constant badgering of him to help to support going dry was, let the women women pray and the men vote. And so that was the sentiment a lot of people in Tennessee had. The women's activities during the Great War really did a lot for women in terms of getting organized. They were already organized in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And through uh, the war work that all the women's groups here in Nashville of all races and nationalities uh, participated in, really gave women a stronger uh, feeling that they could accomplish things. Now, the whole issue of women voting has been far more controversial than women telling the government that nobody should be drinking alcohol. And the reason it is so controversial was because, first of all, it, it does mean somebody's going to have to give up power. When women do get the right to vote, some incredible number 
like 27 million American women were added to the voting rolls. I mean, that opened the elections up to, to an exponentially high number of people who got the right to vote. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson here on words. And this will, you can use this for the next time your friends, your minister, your rabbi, uh, your buddies call this movement the suffragettes. American women never called themselves suffragettes. The British women who wanted the right to vote, and in some respects they were a whole lot more radical than any American women ever dared to be, uh, when a member of parliament had referred to them as suffragettes, they thought it was kind of humorous, and so they called themselves suffragettes. But American women never called themselves suffragettes. They always, in their correspondence, there's lots of it down at the state archives, referred to each other as suffragists. And uh, they, they were very insistent because adding the E-T-T-E -E to the end of suffrage meant that it was somewhat diminutive. It was a lower status. And so they did not want this at all, and they called themselves suffragists. One of the really important points that Elaine Weiss makes in her book, The Woman's Hour, which you're going to hear lots about over the next 10 months, and she's already been here in town two or three times and she'll be here for the Southern Festival uh, the first weekend in October, or second weekend, I guess. Uh, if you want to hear her speak, she'll be speaking down there. But one of the things she does is talk about the origin of the word suffrage, and it means a prayer, a plea. And so it really is, is a very interesting term. And yet again, it takes a long time for change to take place. And it's much easier to convince people, in my personal opinion, it's much easier to convince people that you're against something than you're for something. And so these women had a very difficult time. The National Suffrage Association really got started after the Civil War. There were splits and all manner of things going on in the national movement, but they, the national movement really knew that they were going to have trouble in the South simply because of the problem of race and women voting in the South where Jim Crow segregation was firmly in place were going to have a hard time getting the right to vote because what uh, diehard Southerners saw, well, if you give white women the right to vote, then this is going to open the, the restrictions we have put on African American men and women voting to the federal government and we don't want that to happen at all. So Lyde we we Merriweather was, create, uh, was recruited by the National Suffrage Association to organize the state of Tennessee. And she tried very hard, but her heart was always in temperance. She was one of the temperance workers. And so she tried hard to, to get suffrage going, but frankly, it was just too controversial. Nashville had a suffrage league uh, in the uh, after Light Merriweather got going here, but it died out very quickly. They just couldn't convince women to join it. When in 1907, before the Carmack assassination, the National Women's Christian Temperance Union had its national convention at the Ryman Auditorium. The state president of the WCTU uh, wrote a, a piece that was published in the paper, a disclaimer saying that the Tennessee WCTU does not support woman suffrage. Uh, that was national, but we do not. They wanted to make it clear because they were being criticized for some, some of the members of the national movement support, su supporting suffrage and saying this has to be done. So the movement is very, very slow getting started. Uh, Knoxville eventually gets a suffrage league. Lizzie Crozier French is one of these women that ought to be in every history book. She is quite a phenomenal character in Knoxville, and she got a group going over there. But it, we don't really get a suffrage association in Nashville 
until about 1913 and 1914, right in that period. And once it started, I mean, it grew very, very fast. I, I, I put up here this photograph of Ann Dallas Dudley because she is the woman who, if anybody knows a suffragist from Tennessee or Nashville, this is the name they, that, that they know, Ann Dallas Dudley. I do think that it is wrong to say that she was the leader. She was one of many, and if you look at the correspondence between these women, they worked together. She was not at the top of a pyramid. She just happened to have a good, what shall we call this, media presence. She had a great uh, media presence and was very articulate. She was the second wife of one of the founders of the Life and Casualty Insurance Company. She had two beautiful children, and when the suffragists got going, one of the things they started almost immediately were these marches from the Capitol out to Centennial Park, and she generally led the, the way in these with her two children. There were lots of women participating in this. Uh, Tessie Lowenheim, uh, a woman uh, who was in the Jewish community, and her two children marched behind Mrs. Dudley, her two girls. You don't know the name of Tessie Lowenheim, but I bet all of you know her daughter's names. They're both deceased now. Mary Jane Worthen, who was a very much uh, one of the really activists here in town, particularly in the area of social services, as well as her sister, Elizabeth Jacobs. Uh, they were both very active in the community, and uh, uh, the, the genes came down the family tree there. Uh, and so the, there, were, there were Catholic women in this movement, and yes, eventually there were African-American women as well. Catherine Kenney is one of these women that I really have been particularly interested in, mainly because of things that Abby Milton and Catherine Ken uh, and Ann Dallas Dudley wrote about her. Abby Milton was from Chattanooga, and she becomes the state's uh, suffrage president eventually. But Catherine Kenney had come here uh, with her husband, an Irish Catholic, both of them poor, to open the first Coca-Cola bottling company. And because he made so much money uh, with his initial bottling company, she had an entree into society in Nashville that a poor Irish Catholic living down in that area along the uh, Cumberland River, 2nd Avenue, that area where St. Patrick's Church is, would not have had. She was referred to over and over again as the workhorse. She apparently was kind of a lightning rod because uh, when the women do get the right to vote, and uh, Carrie Chapman Catt wants a history written by somebody in each state, there were people in, in Chattanooga and Memphis who didn't want anybody from Middle Tennessee writing the history. And so this was uh, quite a controversial thing when they had already asked Catherine Kenney to write the official history of Tennessee suffrage. And so in the, the volumes that were published, there's a six volume uh, set of books, The History of Woman Suffrage, that was begun before Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton died. There are two histories of Tennessee, one written by Catherine Kenney and the other written by Margaret Irvin Ford from Lookout Mountain. Uh, I, one woman that people don't know anything about, but she was very active in this movement, was Maria Thompson Davies. Uh, Maria Thompson Davies taught at Ward Belmont. She actually taught China painting. Guilford Dudley and Alice Dudley's son had a miniature of his mother on his desk that she had done forever. Her claim to fame was that she was a novelist and she would be the equivalent of Daniel Steele or a bestseller of romance novels and that sort of thing. She had a national reputation. She, she eventually uh, lives in New York, but she was in Nashville when the Nashville Equal Suffrage 
uh, association was founded, and she went so far as to write a little novella about called The Elected Mother. Uh, her novels, if you, you can get them for probably next to nothing at Elder's, or any antiquarian bookstore may have some of her novels. It, they're all set, mostly set in Tennessee, and uh, uh, they're very uh, syrupy romances. Uh, I will just say that. They're, they're nothing that you're gonna say, oh, I can't wait for this to be republished so my book club can read it. But still, this was, this was the genre that was accepted, and she deserves a lot of credit here. She died, she, she uh, probably had adult onset diabetes from her sort of autobiography called Seven Times Seven, you get a really clear message that she fretted a tremendous amount about her weight. And so uh, she probably had undiagnosed uh, type 2 uh, diabetes. Kate Birch Warner is another woman who from Nashville got uh, active in the suffrage movement. If you go to Christ Episcopal Cathedral downtown or if you ever go down there for lessons and carols or any of their many musical programs, look up and ask somebody who's a member there where the Warner window is in that church because Kate Birch Warner and her husband had three children who died at different ages. Uh, one was, I, I would say, eight or nine years old, there was another one who was a toddler and another one who was an infant, and they died in different years for under different circumstances. There's a very, very poignant cemetery gravestone out at Mount Olivet that's largely hidden by a holly bush, but it is a, a piece of sculpture that the Warners had designed to mark their three children's graves in Italy, and it is an image of Jesus holding these three children, and the ages of the children are the ages of the children that they lost. And she embraced the suffrage cause, and she was a, she was a, uh, what, would, what was the phrase when George Bush was president? I'm a uniter, not a divider. Well, she didn't call herself that, but she definitely was a uniter. She brought these folks from Memphis and Chattanooga with her genteel manners and soft-spoken language back to the fold with the Nashville women, and she, she was the president of the, of the Tennessee Equal Suffrage League. Now, as far as African Americans go, yes, there were African American women who were working actively to get the right to vote. Dr. Maddie Coleman was one of these women. They wanted the right to vote. They also wanted to get, get back the right to vote for the African American men who had lost the vote. But one thing I want to say about Nashville here, I mean, we certainly uh, are not perfect in any way in race relations, and I think we have a long way to go right now. But I will say this, Nashville always had this strong middle-class group of African Americans, the Napiers, uh, the Pre Preston Taylor family and others, the Boyds from the National Baptist Publishing Company. And m by and large, those elite African Americans could vote, but the, the larger population of African American men were not really able to vote. So Maddie Coleman worked a very hard for women to get the right to vote. Frankie Pierce is a woman who we knew nothing about until about 1993. And uh, we found a mention of her name in an interview that had been done 10 years earlier with Abby Crawford Milton from Chattanooga. And she referred to this meeting in the House chamber in May of 1920 uh, in, in which they brought in what, what uh, in her own vernacular, Mrs. Milton referred to is they brought in a, I quote, colored lady to speak. And so the interviewer, Marilyn Bell Hughes, down at the archives, said, followed that question up with, well, what was her name? And by this time, the interview took place, 
Mrs. Milton was pretty close to 100 years old, so she was, you know, really the, the last of these mainline suffragists still alive, and she thought for a minute, and then on the tape you hear her voice saying, I, I, think, it was, I think it was Frankie J something, Frankie Johnson. And Anita Goodstein, who was a friend of mine who taught at Swanee for a long time, finally called me one day and said, um, Carol, I think we know who Frankie Johnson is. It's Frankie J. Pierce. And so you now see her name, Juno Frankie Pierce, J. Frankie and Frankie J. She is buried out at the Greenwood Cemetery. Mrs. Coleman is buried out there too. But she did something quite remarkable, and this is really probably more remarkable even for the white suffragists. She got up in the House chamber at a suffrage meeting in May 1920. She was brought in by the white suffragists, who, and she said, what will we do with the vote? We will use it to uplift our people. So within certain parameters, the suffrage organization was remarkably diverse, certainly for the times in which uh, uh, they were living in 1920. Another suffragist who set steps onto the national stage is Sue Shelton White. Uh, she is considerably younger than most of the others. She's from Jackson, Tennessee. She will join the National Association of Woman Suffrage, but when that organization splits and Alice Paul takes the more activist, younger women into the National Woman's Party, she will follow Alice Paul. She is arrested. Uh, for uh, chaining herself and protesting outside the White House against President Woodrow Wilson during World War I. Uh, she is uh, ta taken to the Aquitaine uh, uh, prison. She is uh, uh, there when the hunger strike takes place. She burned an effigy of Woodrow Wilson in the park across from the White House. And this is in the middle of a war. And you know, the National Woman's Party said, Woodrow Wilson, he's a man with three daughters. He's had two very strong wives. His first wife, Ellen, had died of, I think, Bright's disease. And he married Edith Wilson. Both of these were very strong women. And yet he was very, um, cautious about supporting woman suffrage. And so the Women's Party, Alice Paul and her, party, her group say, this is the time to strike. We're at a war. And so they have signs that compare him to the Kaiser, which he did not take very well at all. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was remarkably thin-skinned for a politician. Uh, there's a really fine biography of him uh, by, I can't think of his first name. Mike, you're, help me, Lindbergh, who wrote the biography of Woodrow Wilson? Somebody, Lind, well, we'll figure this, we'll figure this out here, but uh, it's a really fine book and I'm, I'm pretty sure Mike's read it. He's read a lot of books. And so here you see there, there were these women for whatever reason had gotten into this more activist group, and there is a young Sue Shelton White with them. By and large, the Woman's Party had younger women and not older women. We had a national convention here in Nashville. I mean, we were convention city long, <laughs> long before the Opryland Hotel was built. And uh, we were a, a town for events happening. And so when they came here, uh, it was quite a celebration. There are lots of images of this. Our governor was the Republican, Ben Hooper. Uh, ben Hooper is probably really our, our most progressive governor. He got nothing done. He had a lot of great ideas, but he got nothing done because he was a Republican from East Tennessee, and the Democrats in the legislature were not going to pass a thing he said. He got elected because the Democrats had split over prohibition, and Luke Lee had bolted and supported Hooper in the next election, and that's how he got elected. But it's a really, he was really, I think, a, a governor that deserves more attention than he gets. And during this suffrage uh, 
convention, he brought his daughter over to the Ryman Auditorium uh, to see what was going on because he supported woman suffrage very openly and very readily. Now, the national women, once they get going, they start having these parades. And don't you know this would have been fun? There are some papers down at the archives of one woman who described how excited she was to be in these parades. She wanted to march. They, they went from the Capitol to Centennial Park where they had a rally. And they did this in, in 15 and 16 and... Uh, they didn't do it in 17 uh, because that was after we had gone to war, but they had these parades and marches, and this woman wanted to march, and her husband did not think she was able to walk that far. Now, she's probably younger than anybody in this room at the time, and uh, so he wanted to follow her in his own car, and she just absolutely wouldn't hear of this, but they decorated, they marched, and, and Elizabeth Jacobs, who was really this dear, dear person, told me about, about marching in one of these parades with her mother, Tessie Lowenheim, and she said, Ann Dallas Dudley was as beautiful as everyone said she was, and she had this, this um, uh, appearance, this aura, and she knew how to dress uh, very uh, pertly and attractively, and so she described marching behind the Dudleys, and Mrs. Dudley had on this hat of some kind that had a sort of a flowing veil behind it. I've never been able to find a picture of Mrs. Dudley in that hat, but I do have a picture in my mind. Now she said, Elizabeth also said, that she and her sister Mary Jane were really complaining because their shoes were hurting and their mother had made them wear their best, I'm sure, white pat and leather shoes. You can remember how those felt. And so uh, she, she said that was what she remembered most, but that and Mrs. Dudley's hat. Now, Ann Ellis Dudley was a political activist. And so before Alice Paul really officially broke with the Suffrage Association, she organized silent sentinels to stand outside the entrance to the Republican National Convention in 1916 and the Democratic National Convention in St. Louis. And they were to all be dressed in white. They were to all have a banner that said their state on them. And they were to be silent because especially the Democrats, they really wanted Woodrow Wilson to take a position in favor of woman suffrage. So Ann Dallas Dudley participated in these two uh, political events, uh, the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention. You can see this picture is from St. Louis and it was uh, raining uh, that day. So we can perhaps imagine that those were yellow umbrellas or purple umbrellas. We can perhaps imagine that, but they were not to say a word. Now, the Tennessee women, once now, I, I shouldn't say this very loud because the people in places other than Middle Tennessee will correct me for this, but uh, once Nashville got organized and going, I think Memphis, Knoxville, and Chattanooga also got organized at the same time, and so they start lobbying the legislature. Now, in order for women to get the right to vote, uh, in Tennessee, in all of the elections, the state constitution had to be amended. And that was their first try. They tried to get the constitution amended and they came very close but didn't get it to pass. So they come back in the 1919 session and say, well, how about if you just pass a bill that doesn't require amending the constitution? the legislature could pass a bill for women to vote in local municipal elections and in the national elections. They just couldn't vote in the state elections if the Constitution wasn't amended. So that is kind of convoluted, but that is exactly what they did. So they had proposed this the year before, the session before, and it didn't get passed, so they brought it up again in 1919 
and they got it passed. Now, granted, there was some opposition to this, but since they weren't voting for the, the people who are doing the voting on giving this to women, I think they felt a little more comfortable than this with this than a constitutional amendment. So there is Ann Dallas Dudley, uh, snappily dressed with a lovely hat on, and she and her entourage of Catherine Kenny, Mrs. Folk, uh, Mrs. Gray, Caroline Kimbrough, they go down to get registered to vote. And of course, you have to pay your poll tax. So the Tennessean ran this story and Catherine Kenny's uh, poll tax receipt in the paper so that the Nashville women could vote in the city elections as well as the upcoming presidential election. But still, we didn't have state suffrage. So the movement takes off after World War I ends. Carrie Chapman Catt, who had not actively campaigned for su suffrage during the war, said the time has come for Congress to do this. Woodrow Wilson finally announced that he supported woman suffrage, and on, the House passed the bill to send the amendment to the states for ratification, and then the Senate passed it on June 4th, 1919, and sent it to the states for ratification. Now, the Constitution has a very clear policy in one of the articles, I think Article 6 or maybe, the, maybe Article 7, about how the Constitution shall be amended. And the way that this amendment, you have to have three-fourths of the state legislatures approve the amendment if it's going to be added to the Constitution. So. Finally, in June, it is passed and it is sent out to the states for ratification. Now, Carrie Chapman Catt, if you don't know much about her because she's sort of in the shadow of her protege, Susan B. Anthony, this is a good time for you, not necessarily right here in this class, but to learn about Carrie Chapman Catt. She was a remarkable woman. She was a widow. She had no children, and she had made up her mind to devote the rest of her life to women getting the right to vote. So she is the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association in 1919 when this uh, bill is passed and the amendment is sent out to the states. Now, she was very well organized, as was Alice Paul, and most of these women were highly organized. Uh, they, they, they really weren't thinking that any of the southern states would ratify this amendment. They were going to have to get their votes from the northern states. And uh, as you can imagine, the first week or two of June, uh, some of those states up in the Midwest, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, they ratified it pretty quickly. Then we move into 1920, and as 1919 ends in 1920, we've still got a ways to go. And of course, the goal here is for all women to get to vote in the presidential election of 1920. And this uh, uh, did not look like it was a, a done deal. So in about, I guess, early 1920, we get to state number 35, and all sorts of gloom and doom sets in because some states have, have voted no for ratifications, others have have, dis, have adjourned without doing anything, and the governor won't call a special session. So down at the Capitol in May of 1920, the Tennessee Equal Suffrage uh, uh, League is meeting, and they are about to become the League of Women Voters. This is Kat's plan. The Suffrage Association will become the League of Women Voters. And so this is the meeting in which Mrs. Pierce comes in and speaks on behalf of African American women. And during the course of this whole uh, state convention and various meetings that take place, the idea does come, let's see if we can get our state to become the 36th state, which becomes known as the perfect 36. 
And so that refers to a female's hourglass body, the Gibson girl look sort of, as they play on words. And you know, that was kind of an ambitious idea because our legislature had already adjourned. That's why they were using the House chamber. And then uh, uh, our governor was running for re-election in the Democratic primary. And a lot of the Democrats didn't like our governor, Albert Roberts, although he was a Democrat. Luke Lee did not care for him and was supporting his opponent in the Democratic primary. So he was not going to touch suffrage if he didn't have to because he felt like it would cost him one way or the other in the election. So he was very wary about woman suffrage. But somewhere along the line, these women convinced uh, they they get word to Woodrow Wilson. President Wilson sends a telegram to Governor Roberts, and Governor Roberts calls the special session to take place sometime after the Democratic primary. So, <laughs> and he's not very specific until he wins the primary, and then he calls it very quickly. And so this, this meeting takes place in Nashville in August of 19. 20, it convenes, and the suffragists had been working very, very hard. Carrie Chapman Cat had come into town. They were speaking here, there, and yon, doing street speeches, lots of other things. They were working really, really hard in anticipation of this special session taking place. So Mrs. Cat comes to town. She checks into the Hermitage Hotel, the fashionable spot in Nashville. And uh, she's really intended only to stay a little while, but she stayed until after the amendment was ratified. Uh, Nashville is a lovely, lovely place uh, at this particular time. You can see the Hermitage Hotel there in the background of this image. And uh, the antis will also check in to the Hermitage Hotel there. Now, who could oppose women having the right to vote? Well, Josephine Pearson, for one. She was an unmarried woman, and she, her mother was a, a staunch supporter of the Confederacy, and she had promised her mother in her dying days that if that Susan B. Anthony Amendment ever came to Tennessee, she would do everything she could to stop it. So the, the people who were, the corporations, I suppose, were some of them, recruited her to be the leader of the anti-suffrage movement. So the day after Mrs. Cat checks into the Hermitage Hotel, she gets off the train at Union Station to lead the fight whenever it's going to take place, to lead the fight to prevent Tennessee from ratifying the suffrage amendment. And there she is uh, at their anti-ratification headquarters down at the Hermitage Hotel. This picture is uh, down at the State Archives in her papers. Uh, she and her antis embraced the lost cause. They used that language over and over again. Uh, they certainly used a lot of racial imagery in their campaign, but let's be honest. The suffragists also, Alice Paul, all of the suffragists used racist language in their campaign. She said, Miss Pearson said, it's going to register all these African American men, and all you white women need to be really, really afraid of African American men. You know, that was the, the message they were giving. And then the suffragists were countering that with, uh, well, yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to register African American women, but we've already got laws in place to keep African Americans voting. So you don't need to worry about that because African Americans aren't going to be voting here. And so they used the race card just as well as the antis played the race card. And there were the lots and lots of cartoons. I've probably got a hundred uh, in my files that came out of Mrs. Pierce, Miss Pearson's papers. And uh, they, they bring a lot of people in to uh, voice their uh, opposition to that. This the cartoonists have a field day with this, and uh, the banner uh, publisher. 
uh, 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 Colonel Stallman was very much uh, opposed to women having the right to vote. Luke Lee uh, supported women having the right to vote. The antis, while they're here in town, uh, that hot, muggy summer of 1920, they have a meeting out there at the Hermitage. Everybody was going out there. And again, that both sides were trying to allay the Southern fears of racial mixing. So the antis have lots and lots of things uh, that they want to put forth. And uh, here is one of the posters uh, here that, that the antis use. That's Frances Willard, the temperance woman, uh, in the uh, center of this. And so here they've got a man who is, I mean, this is not nice language. I'm the first to admit this. Uh, but this is the truth. I should have fixed that. Um, there's a convict. There's an Indian. And there's somebody who is insane. So that was, and they blamed, they blamed women for uh, prohibition. I mean, that's why Frances Willard is in here. We sure don't want women having the right to vote. So both papers are in overdrive. The antis are working very, very hard, and it gets down to the Tennessee House. The Senate ratifies it fairly quickly. Um, after the special session convenes on August the 9th. Uh, the House seems to have a majority at the beginning of the special session, but as each day passes, these yellow roses that the people who supported suffrage are being replaced by red roses, the flower of the antis. And so this is a story that everyone in Tennessee probably, I hope by now, has heard uh, how this actually turned out. But in spite of the intense pressure, that's the Senate chamber there, it all came down to this young man, Harry T. Byrne. He was a Republican from over in East Tennessee, Nyota, which you probably never heard of, but it's near Athens, Tennessee, above Chattanooga. And he was opposed to women's suffrage because the political leader, who was an older man from this county, a senator, was staunchly opposed to women's suffrage. So uh, the, probably the thing that upset the suffragists the most was that a day or two before this final vote on August the 18th, none other than the Speaker of the Tennessee House, Seth Walker, announced that he had decided not to support woman suffrage after all. So when the session convenes after a lot of delays that morning of the 18th, there are two motions to table the amendment. In other words, let's not vote on it, let's put it over till next year, which means killing it. And thanks to Banks uh, Turner, a young man from Trenton, Tennessee, he refused to support tabling it, and so the amendment was not tabled, and that gave Harry Byrne his chance to be the her hero here. So we've got other heroes other than Harry Byrne. But Harry that morning had received a letter from his mother. It's typical mother letter, mother handwriting, mother stationery. It's about six pages of all the dealings of cousin so-and-so and aunt so-and-so and, -so and who's sick and this and that and the other. And then she makes the comment that I've been reading the papers, but I haven't seen your name mentioned anywhere. And she made the comment uh, in this letter, it's something to the effect of do the right thing, help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. And so he had made up his mind that he would vote against it if it was clearly going to lose. He would vote against it if it was clearly going to win. But if his vote mattered and the votes to table it had proved that his vote was going to matter, he would vote for suffrage. And so Harry Byrne voted in favor of women having the right to vote. The suffragists and the antis, you can imagine this if you've been in the House chamber, they're up there in the galleries and 
the suffragist, oh my gosh, Harry Burns, has Harry Byrne has changed his mind. And so they're hugging each other and the antis are furious because they felt that they had this deal locked up, so to speak. And so there's pure chaos and Harry Byrne is completely befuddled by what he has done. Uh, we are still debating whether or not he actually climbed out the window of the house chamber. <laughs> that is part of the mythology of Harry Byrne. However, there is a new book out about Harry Byrne that the History Press has put out. The antis really work hard even after this vote on August 18th to get the vote repealed, to have another vote. The, as you see, Major Stallman uh, is heavily involved in this. Uh, uh, are you going to be uh, a subject sex? Uh, let's hold on to your manhood. But nonetheless, it, the vote stood and it was sent off to President, uh, well, well, actually to the Secretary of State of the United States, Bainbridge Colby, to be added to the Constitution. It left Nashville on uh, August 24th and arrived in Washington on August 26th, and it is said that Secretary of State Colby <laughs> signed it before breakfast, before the Tennessee General Assembly had a chance to change its mind. <laughs> So it's really quite a story, and we hopefully are going to have a really nice celebration of this in uh, the summer of next year. August 18th will be a big hurrah. There's all sorts of things going on, but perhaps the most exciting is that the Public Library and the Public Library Foundation are adding, it's under construction as we speak, opposite the Civil Rights Room, which is in the west end of the Nashville Room, they are adding a Votes for Women room that will be permanent. It is permanent. That will be a mirror image of the Civil Rights Room, but it will be about women's rights and women's history at the other end of the hall. It's supposed to open in February. It's going to have a lot of high-tech stuff for kids to put their hands on, and it's going to be really, really a wonderful addition. The State Museum is opening a temporary exhibit early next year that'll be up for about nine months down there. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of things in the work. There's Mrs. Cat receiving congratulations. Now, I bet you don't know who this is. This is my grandmother. <laughs> she lived in our house, and been un un unbeknownst to looking at her from this picture, uh, she was quite outspoken about a lot of things, and I really think I got my interest in history and politics from her. Now, she had one child, and that was my mother. And my mother was born in 1916. My grandmother was 36. My grandfather was 50. And uh, think about this. In November, my grandmother went to vote in Petty, Texas at the Methodist Church because of something that happened here. And she never missed an election, nor did my mother, because my mother at age four was with her, her mother when they went to vote. And so it's a remarkable story, but nobody really thought to tell this until about 20-something years ago when it finally got on the map. And so women's, the women's vote in 1920 did not turn out like the suffragists had dreamed. It turned that a lot of women just didn't care. If they voted, they voted like their husband, their father. The Suffrage Association, now the League of Women Voters, really had a big decline. Uh, there was lots of tragedy that happened to these women. And Alice Dudley's daughter was killed in an accident up in Pennsylvania, uh, crossing a street. She was hit by a truck and died. Trevania, uh, Abby Milton had some kind of personal crisis. Her husband dies in 1924. Uh, so she's distracted. Catherine Kenney's husband went bankrupt because he had expanded the Coca-Cola plant 
and during World War one, he couldn't buy enough sugar to operate his plant at, at full production, so she left the movement, and the League of Women Voters really worked hard to keep things going, but it never, ever quite got the momentum of the suffrage movement, and they did get a few bills passed through the Tennessee General Assembly, but women in general found out it was a whole lot harder to pass legislation than they had, accept, they had expected it to be. And getting women elected to office was even harder. Part of it was the financing of the campaigns. It was very expensive. And an interesting little footnote about these, this final vote, the Davidson County delegation had been staunchly supporting woman suffrage in 1919, but in 1920, they voted against it. Davidson County, now we've got a lot of explanations for that, but we think the corporate money uh, may have had some influence, I don't know, but we're still speculating a lot about that as I speak. So the story, the story is not over yet. There'll always be something uh, new to learn. Governor Roberts paid the ultimate price. He lost in the general election in November to Al Albert Taylor, uh, he, Alfred Taylor. Uh, he, of course, I'm sure was felt like he had done the right thing by supporting the amendment, but the price he paid was quite high. Uh, the decade after that, which people like to call the Roaring Twenties, uh, it was a time of great change in Nashville, and that change always, it change always brings anxiety. And I think the anxiety that the city and the country are facing now is really reaching the digital age. That's the, the big change that's taken place in the past 25 or 30 years, and that has created a tremendous amount of anxiety here. And so you see that this will culminate, not here, although our legislature passed the, the uh, anti-evolution statute here in 1925, but this will kind of culminate down in Dayton with the Scopes trial. Now the last piece of this I want to mention, and this is going to get a save it for next time, uh, next year, uh, uh, attention. The other really remarkable thing that happened in Tennessee, in addition to women getting the right to vote, after World War II, Nashville became the first city in the country, city and Davidson County, the first county to merge all aspects of their government, the creation of metropolitan government. It too is quite a remarkable story. The cartoons, uh, 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 the banner was against it in 1962, and uh, the Tennessean was for it, and they had, both of those papers had editorial cartoonists, and so every day it was something hilarious. You know, the banner, the banner, it's communism, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the communists taking over, and then the, the Tennessean, uh, uh, they, their, their kind of mantra was efficiency, efficiency in government. And, I, you know, I really think if you ask people in the community, businessmen, businesswomen, you ask anybody about Nashville today, I think they would say that, that the good things about Nashville, the growth, have, has been in large part related to the creation of metropolitan government, one government, and this has allowed the music business here to flourish. Uh, it allowed the healthcare industry here to flourish. We have all of these things. We're still the Athens of the South. People want to come here to go to all of these colleges. But metropolitan government is something that was really uh, had a small window of opportunity to happen and it took place here in Nashville. I think to date there are 16 or 17 city-county mergers in the United States. There have been lots and lots of counties that have tried it. I met about a month ago with some folks from Cleveland, Ohio, who want Cleveland to merge their city and county. 
uh, and they talked to me and Bill Purcell and the Chamber of Commerce and several people, but I don't think they'll ever be able to get the support for it. Uh, it'll, I, I hope that, that, that they, uh, they say they've got plenty of, of, of support, but what they're, tr they, you know, they, they don't have the growth that Nashville has. And so, uh, yes, the, the traffic is bad, and yes, I kind of uh, lose my temper when I'm behind a scooter or a pedal, t a pedal tavern. I kind of lose a little patience when I'm behind the pedal tavern, and I'm terrified that one of those girls with the veil is going <laughs> to fall off, and uh, I'm going to hit her. So I'm, I'm a little nervous about some of these things, but we are really lucky to live here. And I have just, in this course, touched the tip of the iceberg. So I hope that you'll join me again. Thank you very much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.